Namaste to everybody. Open heart, open mind. Welcome to the Sattva channel, the official platform of the Sattva project. Uh, my name is Sher Wong, the co-founder of the Sattva project. So first of all, um, I would like to express my thankfulness to our media partner and StreamYard sponsor, Durian ASEAN and uh, Durian FM. And also not to forget the uh, most important people or person behind the scenes, our broadcast director, Brother Chong. We would like to thank him very much for all the for managing all the minor and major uh, technicalities behind the scenes. Uh, Brother Chong, would you like to say hi to everybody? Hi, everybody. Very good evening, Sharap, and uh, all watching today. So for those who are just tuned in, uh, welcome. And please do like and share our post so that more can benefit. And for those of you who are watching later on face, uh, sorry, on YouTube, please do also subscribe and uh, like. Now back to you, Brother Sharap. Thank you. Thanks to you, Brother Chong. Thank you for your generosity and kindness. So today we are going to uh, continue our submission series for the second episode. And uh, let's have a slide of this uh, series. Yeah, today we are uh, in the previous month, we are having a dialogue on the Yoga Chara School of Buddhist Philosophy. But today we are going to continue the same series, but with a different title. Today, entitled the, A Conversation on the Madhyamika School of Buddhist Philosophy. So today we have the same uh, two moderators, Samisha Mission and Samisha Kamle. And uh, we will be with our guest speaker, Dr. Matia. So first of all, let me introduce to you our first moderator, Samisha Mesham. Uh, she is a direct dialogue coordinator of Satwa Youth. Samisha Mesham is currently a student who studies and resides in Thailand. She came from the central part of India, Madhya Pradesh. She has completed her BA from Nagarjuna Training Institute, Nagpur Maharashtra in 2019. She continued her MA in Buddhist Studies from International Buddhist College, Thailand from 2019 until 2021. She's interested in studying uh, different aspects of Buddhist philosophy, and currently she's preparing for her PhD program. So welcome, Samisha Visham. Thank you, Brother Shira. Okay, next, our next moderator will be Samisha Kamli. So both Samisha has the same similar name and similar background as well. And Samisha Kamli is also a dialogue coordinator of Satwa Youth. Uh, Samisha Kamli came from the western part of India, Maharashtra. She's currently a student who studies and resides in Thailand. She has completed her bachelor's degree in 2019 from Nagarjuna Training Institute in Nagpur, Maharashtra. Then she continued her MA in Buddhist Studies in International Buddhist College, Thailand from 2019 until 2021. She's interested in studying different aspects of Buddhist philosophy and presently she's preparing for her PhD. Welcome, Samisha Kamle. Thank you so much, Brother Sarah. Okay, now the floor is belong to both of you, two Samishas, and let the dialogue begin. Yeah. So welcome once again to everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in. And uh, okay, so let me introduce to you our today's speaker, Dr. Madhya Salvini. Dr. Madhya Salvini presently is a Dean of Scriptural Languages and the Faculty of Liberal Arts at International Buddhist College, Thailand. And then he has completed his BA and MA in Sanskrit from RKM Vivekananda College, Chennai. He holds his PhD in Buddhist Studies from the School of Oriental and African Studies, SOS, in London. So a very warm welcome to our today's speaker, Dr. Madhya Salvini. Thank you, Swasti Savadika. So let's begin our today's session. So to start with, so can we have our first slide, Brother John? Uh, okay, so our first question is, uh, okay, so this is a first conversation on Madhyamaka school. So the question is very basic in the beginning. So what is the term Madhyamaka means and what is the main philosophical view of Madhyamaka school? Okay, the term Madhyamaka means relating to the middle path and uh, what is the main philosophical view of the Madhyamaka school is uh, a way to establish emptiness 
so that it entails non-arising and non-cessation. Maybe we can take this as being a very defining feature of the Madhyamaka thought. Two extreme, you just said Madhyamaka means the middle, middle of what? Could you elaborate this term Madhyamaka, Madhyama? Uh, well, according to Nagarjuna himself, uh, the middle path is the same as emptiness, dependent arising, and dependent designation. So Nagarjuna himself has uh, indicated what we should take to be the middle path through this, in some sense, identification of uh, emptiness and uh, dependent arising as having the same referent, even though they may not have the same meaning. So if we want to go into how Nagarjuna himself presents what is the middle path, then we have to present it probably in this manner. Uh, the middle path in general is uh, um, the idea that there is no view of eternalism, Shashvatavada, and no view of uh, cutting off of consciousness at death, Uchedavada. So this is a common feature. In the case of Madhyamaka, there's also an emphasis of uh, being the middle path in the sense of avoiding the two extremes of exists and not exist. And uh, how exactly this is done in Madhyamaka depends a little bit on how we decide to interpret Nagarjuna's works. So not all Madhyamaka philosophers will have exactly the same way to uh, explain how to best avoid these two extremes of existence and non-existence. Teacher, um, like all Buddhist school try to interpret uh, Madhyama, what is the middle way? Yes. And they all try to emphasize on w w what is the middle way in, uh, let's say, uh, in from Theravada perspective, they say that uh, Arya Stangik Marga, going through the Arya Stangik Marga, it's, 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 a, it's a kind of a middle way. So what, what how Madhyamaka school differ from that? Uh, well, it differs in the way it uh, explains the avoidance of the two extremes of uh, asti and nasty. It exists and it doesn't exist. Now, this idea of uh, avoiding these two extremes exists, of course, also in the Theravada tradition. Uh, because there are some suttas that uh, mention this very explicitly, but um, it is explained then in the Theravada tradition in a different way. So when they encounter suttas which speak about this avoidance of these two extremes of existence and non-existence, when they explain how to do that avoidance, you will see where the difference from Madhyamaka is. Uh, but remember the name Madhyamaka is mainly because the school takes as its foundational text the Mula Madhyamakarika, which contains this particular word, Madhyamaka. You, you understand? So the, the name Madhyamaka is not because they're the only ones who present a middle path. All the Buddhist schools do that. But because the foundational text of the school happens to be called Mula Madhyamaka Karika, that gives the name to the whole school. It's just like the name Yoga Ajara, which is used by all the schools, but because the foundational text of the school is called Yoga Ajara Bhumi, that becomes the name of the school. So we should not uh, think too much just of the name. Is uh, the, the specific way in which the Madhyamaka establishes the middle path has to do with the... We could understand it in this way, if, if you wish, that um, the other schools are establishing the middle path by explaining 
what doesn't exist and what really exists. While the Madhyamaka explains the middle path by showing that existence and non-existence pertain only to conventionalities. So in this respect, there is a rather significant difference between Madhyamaka and the other schools of Buddhism. We have got a long question from audience now. So it's a okay. question from Wu Wei. Wu Wei. Um, yeah. So people tend to think that Madhyamika is dry, boring, and unfunctional. Is, is this true? <laughs> if not, how could we make it juicy and colorful? How could we manifest the usefulness and functionality of Madhyamika view in our daily lives? Or to express it core by performing arts such as dancing or the humor, theater, and movies, since these are the things that can change people's mind and lives directly and impactfully. Oh, okay. Easy answer. Accumulate merit. That's how to do it. Um, if one has a huge amount of merit, then uh, there is no chance that when there is Madhyamaka, it will uh, seem boring and unfunctional uh, because it will be much more direct than any other possible activities, including uh, dancing and humor. It will be not a ordinary dance, if you wish, but it, it will be a kind of um, Mahanamakaka, uh, a great <laughs> dance, much better than uh, the one that one can do externally. So, um, yeah, my uh, opinion about that is pretty simple. Accumulate a lot of merit and then read Madhyamaka again and then see whether it still looks dry. I don't think there is the need to make a specific uh, effort or that there is a specific um, recipe or technique to make these things uh, look for what, what they are rather than uh, what we conceptualize that is going to be dry and boring. But rather we need to gather the proper causes and conditions and then it's going to happen somewhat spontaneously. That is my understanding at least. So teacher, do you need to say that whosoever is interested in reading Madhyamika, they have a very good accumulation of merit? Yeah, definitely. And uh, for those people who just study this for the sake of debating or just for showing them, showing that they know something more for them, what is the case? Well, you know, there is the saying that if you use the Dharma not in accordance with the Dharma, the Dharma itself becomes the cause to be born in the lower realms. So it's pretty simple. It's a, it's a question of intention. So one should check one's intention again and again when uh, studying something like Madhyamaka. Madhyamaka, there's an interesting part of um, Avalokita Vrata's uh, sub-commentary on Bhavi Veka's commentary on the Mula Madhyam Karika, if I remember correctly, where he explains how precious the Madhyamaka teaching is and the special conditions under which it has to be transmitted. He even speaks of specific times of the day when it can be explained, uh, how it relates to the other teachings, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, of course, nowadays we are in a different situation, but generally speaking, the teachings of Yoga Arara and uh, Madhyamaka are regarded to be teachings which uh, disclose more or less directly the view of emptiness. And uh, this is uh, ideally um, expressed under certain conditions. So if we move away our mind for a moment from the present situation where sometimes uh, uh, we, we don't come in contact with the teaching in the ideal situation, so to speak. But 
if you think of uh, a different way to approach Madhyamaka, wherein uh, there is a kind of check-in, whether one has the minimum qualification in terms of, especially of intention, then you can imagine that um, uh, learning Madhyamaka in that way may have a different impact and uh, might be more immediately beneficial in a way. So I don't think that there is, again, a very fixed, easy uh, recipe because really it depends from one's merit. But if one makes an effort towards uh, a clarity of intent and also accumulates these prerequisites, then I think that uh, it's unlikely that Madhyamaka is going to appear boring, dry, or anything like that. Okay. Thank you. And then uh, there is one more question from C.W. Wong, right, Samisha? Yeah. Before that, can we take a one question from O. Wayne again? Yeah, yeah, yeah sure. Yeah. Uh, he said yeah, that uh, Nagarjuna once said, all philosophies, all philosophies are mental fabrications. There has never been a single doctrine by which one could enter the true essence of things. So is okay. Madhyamaka a philosophy or not? Or is it merely a way of living and being? Okay, can you please show me where exactly Madhyamaka uh, Nagarjuna said that? He has quoted in double quotation mark, but he didn't, he didn't give a source like where it is said. Then I don't know what to say. Mm -mm. So the questioner can listen, can mention the source. So yeah, if I could see the source it. and possibly the original text, then maybe I can mm -hmm. answer. But otherwise, I'm not sure. Okay, so we'll move to our next question. Uh, the next question is from uh, C. W. Wong. He's asking that how should we meditate upon the view of Madhyamaka? Can you give us an example? Okay. Um, I cannot give you an example. I'm sorry. <laughs> I cannot give you an example because generally speaking, I, um, when it comes to actual meditation instruction, it's a very delicate, um, uh, matter and uh, you enter a kind of a very hmm, how can i say it demanding relationship to some extent so if i have to share how to do uh actual meditation on madhyamaka i don't know you you don't know me is it a good idea do we really want to go in that direction i not sure it's uh uh it's really wise so rather i can point out to some texts where you can get an idea kind of outline of some of the approaches on how to meditate on madhyamaka and then if you find that uh, that is something appealing to you my suggestion is that seek out a teacher and uh, try to get some personal instructions after developing the right motivation. So once again, the first step is the motivation, which is one has to have uh, the wish to get out of samsara and bodhicitta. And meanwhile, you can read, for example, the stages of meditation of Kamala Shila, which is uh, a very good uh, outline of a certain type of Madhyamaka meditation also, including both the shamatha and the vipassana aspects. And you can read the Bodhicharyavatara, which gives an overview of the whole uh, path of practice from the Madhyamaka perspective. Or for something more concise, you could read the Tattvaratnavali, the garland of uh, uh, reality jewels, where you find some very short uh, meditation instructions. Of course, it's very hard to just pick up these texts and use them for meditation 
without any kind of guidance or experience in meditation, but they will give you some idea of what it means to do meditation from a Madhyamaka perspective. And then on that basis, you can get some feeling of whether you are really drawn towards it. And then you have to make the effort. You have to find someone, ask them, beg them to teach you some meditation and they will decide whether they feel comfortable doing that or not. I think that is the right way to go about such things, uh, in my opinion. So I cannot give a reply which is uh, like now telling you how to do meditation or so I don't think, uh, I don't know you, I'm sorry, <laughs> you don't know me. So this is as much as I can say for that. Okay, then let's take Brother Sharab's question. Uh, how can we apply the view of Madhavika in our day-to-day -day living? <laughs> yeah, kind of the same reply. <laughs> uh, in the sense that uh, um, I think that that should happen spontaneously. Like this, uh, there is a very interesting idea which I have observed many times, like this and this in daily life. Okay, so my question when people say in daily life, my question to them is, what is non-daily life? W what exactly do you mean? Is there some life which doesn't happen day by day? Or is this, or are there some kind of times which don't count? So the point is uh, uh, the difference between uh, meditation and post-meditation. That actually is the point. If we analyze what, what it boils down to, uh, what people are talking very often is whether one is doing formal meditation or whether one is in the post-meditation. And this from a Madhyamaka point of view is very clear, very, very clear from the entirety of the um, Mahayana point of view. Very simple. When one is in meditation, one is engaging primarily in the practice of the Dhyana Paramita and Pradnya Paramita when one is applying especially more of the Vipassana aspect. When one is outside of meditation, one should have a conduct which uh, is the application of the other parameters and these other, other perfections. Uh, sorry, earlier I was referring to the perfections of meditation and wisdom. Uh, dhyana is meditation, pratnya is wisdom. And uh, the other parameters, the other perfections as well, should be practiced by eliciting whichever uh, understanding of emptiness one may have. So, if one is trying to develop and practice according to a Madhyamaka view, then when they are going to practice the, the perfections, they should uh, apply their understanding of emptiness according to that view during the post-meditation. So, you can see that, of course, the formal meditation is very important because that will create the, the basic mental background. It will strengthen the basic mental background that when then one can carry out throughout the day. So then whichever uh, sense of emptiness one have, one should apply that when one is doing dana, when one is uh, guarding one's discipline, when one is uh, practicing uh, forbearance with others or with difficult situations, when one is applying heroism. And of course, also when one does meditation, one applies this uh, yoga of no perception in the sense of not perceiving that there is any real meditation, anything real to meditate upon, or any real meditator. So, 
that actually is, uh, although it is not expressed in the language of daily life, which I think is ultimately a Christian language. This is my suspicion, because it comes from the idea that, uh, probably from the idea that there is uh, one week, one day during the week when people go in church and then they do things outside of the church in their daily life. But in fact, the Buddhist language in this respect is more about meditation and post-meditation. So when one is practicing Samadhi, formally, and when one is out of Samadhi. Now, of course, the red thread there is mindfulness, Smriti. And uh, in the case of uh, the application of mindfulness outside of a meditation, that primarily refers to guarding uh, the, uh, one's body, speech, and mind, which is very easy. I mean, it's very difficult, but it's very easy in terms of understanding it because it just means, okay, watch what you're doing with your body and with your speech. That actually is easier in a way and is what one should watch mostly when one is with others. And when one is with, uh, not with others, then primarily watch one's mind. This is not my idea, by the way. You, you can check who said that. Um, but I think uh, for these questions regarding daily life, I, in general, I would try to recast them into this different language and more Buddhist perspective of understanding the relationship between meditation and post-meditation. Yeah. yeah. I guess uh, maybe was it not about like people who like do not commit themselves for studying this philosophy so rigorously and uh, like engage in so many different kinds of activities still have a wish to practice Dharma? Okay, that's a broader question and it doesn't have to do so much with Madhyamaka itself, if you think about it. So it depends very much which Dharma they want to practice. Uh, the general point, my suggestion would be, well, if you have not much time, then focus on Dana and Shila. Dana can be uh, accomplished by even if one doesn't have much because it's not how much one gives but is the sincerity of the intent and shila if one is extremely busy and doesn't have the sufficient motivation to meditate and study well then that person could try at least to focus on shila observe uh, one's behavior very closely and observe uh, whether it is in harmony with the guidelines on uh, ethical conduct that we find in the Buddhist texts. And uh, that is a, a very good foundation of all other good qualities. And it's also a very good foundation for many lifetimes. Is not in itself a cause of liberation, but of course, and, and it's not a cause of omniscience, but if a person doesn't have much motivation and doesn't have much time, then they cannot expect to have <laughs> these very high results, such as the uh, eradication of mental afflictions or the end of samsara. One has to be a little bit realistic. So if one wants to have a minimal engagement, one can, uh, in my opinion, focus on that. Dana and Shila, it doesn't mean they don't do any meditation or any kind of study, but that could be somewhat uh, secondary and uh, not the main focus of their practice and they can be aware of it. Yeah, so studying Madhyamika is like a full-time commitment? Uh, well, in theory, yes. In the sense that uh, 
studying the Dharma should be a full-time commitment in general. Or one can do it uh, not as a full-time commitment according to one's time, but then with the clear intention that uh, one wants to improve one's situation. Because if we are not uh, having a full-time commitment, that usually means that we don't have much merit. And therefore, we need to work on that so that slowly we get to the position where we're not involved with many other activities disconnected with the Dharma or where we have methods which can make all activities connected with the Dharma. But I want to say that those methods should not be taken lightly. This is, uh, of course, uh, even just developing bodhicitta for those who want to practice the Mahayana, it is said there is this very, in, in a sutra, uh, there is this uh, point, like there is a king who has uh, a lot of commitments and cannot really practice in the, all the perfections very assiduously. So he asks to the Buddha what he can do. And the Buddha said, just give rise to bodhicitta several times every day, just the bodhicitta of intention, of wishing for Buddhahood for the sake of all sentient beings. And that itself is going to be uh, unimaginable merit. So that already is great. And I think that uh, if one takes care to do that, it doesn't take a lot of time, strictly speaking. And one can also reflect on the need of bodhicitta throughout the day while doing other things. But giving really rise to bodhicitta is quite difficult. That is the challenge. It's something that one should not underestimate. Uh, someone who has a genuine bodhicitta, even for one moment, is described as someone who has already solved a lot of problems in the Buddhist text, when you see the description of what are the effects, then you can see that it is something very special. And therefore, I think that uh, that could be a very good way, but at the same time, we should be aware that uh, not just in terms of time in that case, but in terms of uh, developing such a vast intention can be a challenge. And one should take it for that, being aware that it's a challenge and work in that direction. And if one feels that uh, it's still not very sincere, one can improve by reflection, uh, by reading a bit. And when the occasion comes, if one is uh, knows somebody that they feel they have some confidence, or oh, this person is somewhat stable, in this development of bodhicitta, try to spend time with uh, that person. Like if, if one knows somebody who can inspire in that direction. So, uh, yeah, again, it boils down to intention very much. Okay. Can we have a next slide? <clears throat> Why should one study Madhyamaka philosophy? For uh, uh, liberation and omniscience, that, that's why. To become a complete Buddha, that, that is the reason. That's the same. It's the same answer I gave for yoga, Chara philosophy. If, uh... yes. So if somebody, if somebody is uh, interested in... Uh, Buddhahood, I think that is the main reason. But of course, I realize that some people might find this too far. So usually it happens that uh, we get an attraction to some philosophy. We don't even know exactly why. Then we read more and hopefully our understanding becomes clearer and clearer 
and also the context and the purpose of that philosophy becomes better, uh, better understood, clearer in our mind. So different people might want to study Madhyamaka for different reasons. I mean, from my perspective, from a Buddhist perspective, uh, I think the ideal reason to study Madhyamaka philosophy would be because one wants to become a Buddha. One really has a very ambitious goal. And the other basic reason is to know reality. Uh, even if we are not yet sure as to whether Madhyamaka is the best way to know reality, maybe we are uncertain, but nevertheless, uh, a lot of really remarkable people have been quite convinced that Madhyamaka is uh, the best possible philosophical approach to the nature of things. And therefore, just in order to know the nature of things, we might want to study Madhyamaka and uh, better understand whether our usual experience is reliable or whether we are completely fooling ourselves. So I think that could be uh, also a good motivation. Okay, there is one more question from audience. Um, Ram is asking, how does this all relate to compassion? Well, it relates to compassion in more than one way. In the case of, uh, of the Mahayana in general, first of all, it relates to compassion in the sense that uh, compassion is the motivation, is the motivating factor for developing bodhicitta. The, that's the kind of the starting point. One is paradukka uh, dukki, someone who feels pained by others' suffering. And therefore, compassion has this role in terms of the intent. Furthermore, the teachings of uh, emptiness uh, will open the door to more profound aspects of compassion because there are certain types of compassion which are unique to those who have some realization of emptiness and they culminate in the great compassion of a Buddha, which is, of course, entirely infused with uh, the realization of emptiness, so that the two become like two sides of the same coin. So these are the different ways in which studying Madhyamaka will have an, uh, a relationship with the practice of compassion in terms of the initial intent, in terms of uh, how compassion becomes deeper during the path, and in terms of the final result of Buddhahood. Okay, I think let's uh, take one question from our slide. So Brother Chong, can we have our next, next question, please? What is emptiness, shunyata? Could you explain it in relation to dependence arising? Pratite um, samuppada. Well, um, I think it is understood that this is according to the Madhyamaka school. So what is emptiness? Emptiness is the nature of things, which at the same time is the absence of any nature. I think this is one way we can understand it. And dependent arising is the way in which emptiness appears, 
So it's the side of uh, appearance. Uh, dependent arising proves emptiness because, and I think this kind of answers uh, a question which I saw is in another slide, because dependent arising uh, from the Madhyamaka perspective involves or entails non-arising. So from the side of experience and perception, all experiences and perceptions are dependently arisen. And from the side of freedom, from uh, uh, perception and experience, all perceptions and experiences are empty. So this could be one way somewhat briefly and uh, maybe with some degree of simplification to introduce these two aspects uh, from a perspective of Madhyamaka. Okay, uh, there is one relative uh, question to this. Uh, Venerable Dakina is asking, what, what, what do you think is the purpose of addressing the dependent origination from an inner and outer perspective within the Shali Stamba Sutra? Clarity. Because the example uh, that we find in the Shali Stamba Sutra of a plant is an example that is uh, clearly re relatable and uh, visible and that we can somewhat um, conceptualize is the while all the elements of the internal dependent arising the one which pertains to a person are rather difficult to perceive they're quite difficult even to imagine so from that perspective i think that the example of the plant brings a lot of clarity and is very usefully employed also to understand how the maturation of karma works. So that is also, I think, another purpose to use this example, because quite often we use the terminology of bija, of seeds, when explaining karma, uh, but, and this itself, we, immediately brings us to this kind of outer example, but we don't always find a full-blown example like in the Shali Stamba Sutra, where one speaks also of seeds, but then clarifies it through an example of earth, water, etc., etc. So I think, as it is the case for many other examples, this has um, purpose of bringing some clarity towards something which is a little bit more difficult to understand. So this is just now you said that it is some, uh, somewhere related to explaining about how karma works. So how that example yes. of the seed changing into sprouts ex explains this. Like, could you please more elaborate over this? Oh, there are several ways in which it, do it does so. Um, one of the ways, for example, is uh, the explanation of why we can get liberation even when, even without exhausting karma. And uh, uh, the explanation is that it's just like when you have seeds, but you don't have water. So if you remove the kleshas, the karma might be there, but they will not be. It will not be sufficient to uh, project a new samsaric birth. So this is one example. Another example is when it is explained that from a, a very small action, from a single karma, we will get a very vast uh, maturation of karma. And this is shown by the example of a seed. You can plant a very small seed, but the, the final result could be a huge tree. So, these are ways in which the function of karma is somewhat clarified in the context of the Shari Stamba Sutra by employing 
this uh, agricultural example. Okay, thank you, Risa. And then uh, there is one more question from Thomas Edwards. He's asking, can you talk about the wisdoms within the afflictions? For example, anger. When is anger useful and how is best to relate to it and to express it? Hmm. Oh, anger is useful when it is directed towards one's own mental afflictions. So anger can be used within oneself. If one uh, wants to remove all the afflictions, one can use anger, which is an affliction, skillfully in this manner by getting very upset that one has uh, anger, <laughs> hatred, desire, etc., and vowing to wage a war against the afflictions very fiercely and getting very motivated to be the ultimate warrior against the afflictions. In that case, one can develop anger. As for uh, using anger outside, I wouldn't recommend it unless one has some kind of clairvoyance. So if somebody has really some special qualities, then they can make a display of anger, even when they're not really angry. And then that could be useful. They know that uh, they know that actually the, the end, the benefit of the end result is going to outweigh the shortcomings of making a display of anger. And of course, there could be cases like if one has to discipline a child, for example, and uh, the child really is putting oneself in danger, or it could be also an adult actually, and one needs to be a little bit fierce to ensure that that person doesn't put oneself at risk due to one's own foolishness. If one is quite confident that uh, one's display of uh, anger is going to have that kind of benefit, then it might be perfectly reasonable in my opinion. Like if one has a small child and the child is running towards a fire or uh, somewhere or, or from a balcony where the child could fall, it's totally reasonable to shout to the child to make the child stop and avoid from dying. So those are cases where, however, it is quite hard to know whether it is really anger. Because when the mother shouts to the child, it's anger, but not really aversion. So this is one key distinction. There might be an element of anger, like the mother might be upset or uh, somewhat uh, frustrated, but the mother will not have hatred towards the child. Uh, not so, well, usually, I mean, I'm saying in an ideal situation. So I think that one can look at it from this perspective Generally speaking, I wouldn't uh, personally, I don't think it's so positive to uh, like some people now have this idea that we should channel anger because it gives us energy for change or something like that. Okay, maybe there are some such situations where that is the case, but uh, I think one really has to have some vision to go through through that kind of course of action because uh, well, the Buddha has mentioned that usually we don't uh, meet anger or hatred with anger or hatred, but rather with maitri, which is its opposite. And uh, this usually, although it is more challenging, it's a bit counterintuitive because we might think that we always have to have some kind of conflict. But nevertheless, it might be uh, in the long term, it might uh, plant the seeds for a very good result. So 
personally, I don't think that it is an advisable course of action to try to find energy in anger, or at least it should be handled with a lot of care because we don't know uh, what that is going to mean in terms of negative effects. Okay, so the one who asked this question found your answer to be excellent, three times excellent. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, and there is uh, a definition of emptiness given by Alejandro, who is saying emptiness is the true is the nature of things, which at the same time is the absence of any nature. Dependent arising is the way emptiness appears. Yeah, you just so, wrote what I said earlier. Okay. So, <laughs> yeah. so teacher, when we talk about this, like dependent arising is the way emptiness appears. So, um, like when we read in Shali Stamba Sutra and Vigraha Vyavartini as well, so Shali Stamba Sutra shows that the relation, I haven't read full, but uh, initially it shows that the relation between cause and effect. And so then, uh, like, a question comes to my mind, how does, in this context, illusion co come into picture? Huh. Uh, the relation between cause and effect is illusory. There it is. Uh, can you please explain it further? <laughs> uh, well, the Shali Stamba Sutra itself, I think, tells you at some point that how dependent arising should be seen. Do you remember? Maybe I haven't read that part. <laughs> Okay, uh, when you get to that part, you will find that dependent arising should be seen as unborn. So that way you already know. It's an illusion. If dependent arising is free from birth, is free from arising, that means it's not a real process. It's an illusory process. Okay, I always had some problem with understanding free from arising and free from cessation. I think we have next question for that. Okay. Okay. Okay, so if we, Brother Chong, can we have next slide? We have that question on next slide. Is it theory of true truth? Maybe after this slide. So we will take first this question and we will go to next slide. Yeah, this. Okay. Also, okay, which one should I answer to? Sorry. Number five or number four? Number five. Number five, okay. Yes, there is a paradox uh, because normally, well, not in this verse because this is not even a complete sentence. Mm, yes. Like in, in itself, this part doesn't make sense. But if we look at the next part, Yaf praditya samutpadam prapancho pashamam shivam desha yamasa sambuddha stambandeva tatambara. So the paradox is that praditya samutpada, dependent arising, is described as anutpadam, non arising. I mean, what could be more paradoxical? So, and of course, this is an introduction to the two truths. Praditya samutpada, if we want to describe the same. Thing. Let's say we look at uh, one dharma, uh, anything whatsoever, if we want to describe it from the side of conventions or from the side of experience and perception, we can describe it accurately as dependently arisen. We can always show that it is dependent on something from the Madhyamaka perspective. If we want to describe it, from the perspective of emptiness, we can describe it as free from arising, free from cessation, and completely beyond the conceptual mind, empty. So uh, in this way, for anything whatsoever, uh, we can see that any dharma bears the two truths. And these two truths relate to this uh, Parent paradox that we find in these uh, first two verses of the Mula Mademo Karika. Yeah? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay. Um, do we have any question? Any other question? No, from... maybe we don't have any question from audience. So let's move on towards our fourth question. 
Okay, so uh, sorry, fourth question, Brother Chong. Yeah, could you explain the theory of two truths from the perspective of Madhyamaka school and how does it differ from other non Mahayana schools? Well, let's think about it from the perspective uh, of uh, Shanti Deva's definition, which I think is somewhat useful. There's two truths. One truth is the truth of the blockage or covering, and the other truth is the ultimate truth. So the nature of things, the ultimate truth is not within the scope of the mind. And the mind itself is called covering or blockage. So this is a short, very short way of uh, establishing the two truths. And uh, when one says uh, the mind is uh, the covering or blockage, or the conventional truth. That includes also the subtle concepts of existence and non-existence. And uh, this is where there is a difference between Madhyamaka and the other schools, because the other schools are going to establish the two truths in terms of uh, some things that really exist and some things that exist only conventionally. And the Madhyamaka is going to establish the two truths by relegating existence and non-existence only to the side of conventionality. And therefore, when uh, one uh, wants to speak about ultimate truth for the little bit that that is possible, one thing that Madhyamakas would say is that it is free from these concepts of existence or non-existence. So that makes it somewhat unique uh, within the, uh, con the overall uh, framework of Buddhist philosophy. Madhyamakas, as far as I know, are the only ones who would take that step. Yeah, okay. So, um, so but these are if uh, two truths, how uh, Theravada, like from Theravada perspective, how two truths would be explained? Oh, from Theravada perspective, uh, in my understanding, at least, if we take the Theravada Abhidhamma, uh, when the word uh, ultimate is used in the sense of existence, then the highest truth refers to the four classes of Paramattas. And then the other uh, entities that we normally speak about, like persons, tables, etc., will fall under conventional truths. So it's kind of straightforward, I think. Of course, there are cases where um, ultimate truth is a word reserved for Nibbana alone. I think this is a case also uh, in uh, other non madhyamaka types of philosophy, but that's because the word paramartha or paramatta then is used in a slightly different sense, meaning the ultimate purpose, not that which exists in the ultimate sense. But here we were talking about how the two truths relate to levels of reality. And uh, within that context, uh, in my understanding, from the Theravada perspective, it's the four categories of paramattas that would belong to ultimate truths and uh, everything else that we speak about would fall under conventional truths. Uh, is, uh, when, uh, according to Madhyamika philosophy, so when they analyze the dharmas, which according to Shavaka perspective, which ult exists ultimately, so uh, they prove that as itself to be not existing substantially. So uh, how, how is the case for the three natures which is explained in Yoga Jara? So do they, do they apply the same type of uh, analysis for the three natures as well? 
they just think that it has been misunderstood by yoga Ajana philosophers that can, it, they cannot be established in that way because they disagree on one very basic point on two well more than one but one basic very basic point is that for the yoga Ajara, the Paratantra Svabhava is real, the dependent nature is near, because for the yoga Ajara, dependent arising proves existence. If something really is dependently arisen, so if something has causes and conditions for its arising, that, it, that proves that it exists. But for the Madhyamaka, that actually proves that it doesn't ultimately exist. So that's where they differ. They would not agree that the dependent nature can be established as ultimately existent. And uh, yes. Um, how Paratantra could be ultimately existent, like, let's say from the Yogacara perspective also. Why, Why not? understand it that way? because it really comes into existence from previous causes and conditions how could it not be okay so uh, like substantially they exist or they just uh, yeah. really they comes together like cause and effect it's the same thing the what you just said is the same thing substantially only means really uh, it's just a translation of the word dravyasa that's all it doesn't have uh, it doesn't mean there is something below or something like that. That's just the English uh, undertone. But it just means uh, if something exists, whether we have a concept of it or not, that is substantially existent. So the Paratantra Swabhava is what makes it possible for us to have concepts in the first place from the Yoga Chara point of view. So there is no question that it's going to be dependent on when, if we have a concept of it exists, otherwise not. So it has to exist. But from the Madhyama point of view, no, that is not the case. And uh, the several reasonings offering the, offered by the Madhyamaka in the in later uh, debates between Madhyamaka and Yoga Ajara, the crucial point becomes whether you can apply the reasoning of one and many to the mind, just like it is uh, applied to uh, the uh, outer things. So that's where we disagree. That, that becomes the clear disagreement. Whether we can have uh, um, this uh, type of analysis, is it one or many? in order to show that it does, it is not real. For the yoga chara, we cannot do it with uh, the mind. And they have their own ways of explaining why we cannot do it for the mind. For the Madhyamaka, we can do it for the mind too. And therefore we can show that the mind too is just an illusion. Okay, so then uh, I think that reminded me of that what we have read in Tatva Ratnavali. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so I think next question from our slide, right? We don't have any yeah. questions from audience today. Mm -hmm. Or have you missed any questions now? <laughs> How Madhyamaka philosophers investigate? <laughs> the phenomenal world at conventional level. It depends. Uh, there are different types of Madhyamaka philosophers and at a conventional level, they uphold slightly different uh, views. The view of Chandrakirti, in my opinion, is a bit closer to the Sarvastivada when it comes to conventional truths. The way he presents his system of Abhidharma is a little bit closer to that, but not exactly. It's not exactly like that. Others are closer to the Sautrantika, and I think this is the case for Bhaviveka, for example, while others are closer to the Yoga Ajara, such as uh, Shantarakshita and uh, Kamarashila. So different Madhyamaka philosophers employ slightly different uh, models for the analysis of conventional truths. 
They do, although ultimately there is no perception, there's no experience, and there's no samsara, there's no nirvana, etc., etc. However, they do have a conventional representation of uh, everything that is presented in the other schools, and in this, these different authors seem to differ somewhat. Teacher, can you uh, explain how Chandrakirti uh, understand the phenomenal words from the perspective of Sautran, sorry, Vibhashika? Well, when he presents his own list of dharmas, he presents it more or less in a Panchavastu scheme. So in that respect, there seems to be some similarities. He also criticizes one or two occasions. Now I don't remember. I think two occasions. Uh, some of the views of uh, Vasubandhu, which are normally regarded as... Uh, Sautrantika style criticism of Vaibhashika, and it seems to, to me that he is actually defending something closer to the Vaibhashika view in those instances. So, in that respect, in my opinion, his position is somewhat closer to, uh, broadly speaking, Saravastiva the Fold without some of the um, reformations or criticisms which we find in the Abhidharma Hosha Vashya. That is my conclusion so far. It's actually, I think, a difficult point of Chandrakirti's philosophy. But uh, I gave it some thought. This, uh, this is the conclusion that I've come to so far. Yeah. Sir, we have got one question. <laughs> we have got one question from Vikko Gyanabodhi. Sawadika. <laughs> Can you please tell something about the idea of emptiness of emptiness? Oh, okay. Um, that idea is... Uh, well, it, it's presented differently in different uh, philosophies. Like, it's an idea which you, which you will find um, d discussed both in uh, Yoga Ajara and Madhyamaka because it's part of a list of emptinesses which is found in the sutras. And uh, some interpreters have taken it to, uh, as a kind of warning not to take emptiness as a kind of ontological ground of some sort, or like emptiness itself as a type of absolute. So emptiness of emptiness would be a response to that. But I'm not entirely sure that it refers precisely to that. Maybe it's in the right direction, but um, to have a really precise understanding, it would be good to look back at those com commentaries, both Yoga Jara and Madhyamaka, where the word is actually discussed. And I think that there are a couple. So uh, if you want to know it really in a reliable way, beyond this general idea that I have expressed, I can later on send you some passages where Yoga Jara or, and or Madhyamaka philosophers offer some gloss to this expression, shunyata, shunyata, which is found in the sutras. Yeah. yeah. Next question from our slide. Yeah. No, no, there is one question from audience I see here. Okay, let's oh, take yes, it after that. Just now. Yeah, just now. It's from Alessandro. It's from, can we take that question or before this? Yes. Okay. Could you explain the different usages of negation, non-affirming and affirming negations in Prasangika and Swatantrika? Ah, okay. Uh, well, 
the question is difficult because the terminology of prasangika and swatantrika is uh, a much disputed point. It's not clear uh, whether this terminology was used much to classify Madhyamaka thought in India, uh, while it becomes quite prominent at some point in the Tibetan tradition. So, how do different types of negation relate to the idea of prasanga and uh, swatantra prayoga? Because this is the origin of that distinction. Prasangika comes from this word prasanga, which means uh, a consequence, an, an unwanted entailment, and an unwanted consequence of a certain position that someone might uh, bring up in order to convince another person that that position is untenable and uh, should be discarded. And uh, this is the preferred method of argumentation of Chandrakirti. On the other hand, Bhavi Veka argued that uh, that method of argumentation is not very convincing to others. And we should rather present what is called an independent application of the logical ground, Swatantra Prayoga, according to the accepted formalization of uh, arguments which were current at his time starting from uh, pratitnya, a kind of uh, uh, um, thesis, a position. Because otherwise, when we show the, just the consequence, negating, for example, that something exists from itself, then it will be understood that we accept the opposite position that something uh, exists due to arising from something else. And that is where this uh, distinction of two types of negation becomes important because then uh, what Chandrakirti says is that, uh, well, we are not using negation in a way as to imply its opposite. We just have a, a complete negation, simple but complete negation, uh, a prasadja type, type of negation, where we just negate without implying the opposite. And therefore, that particular flaw that you bring about is not there in our reasonings. And that's how uh, there is a relationship between bringing up the distinction into uh, of these two types of negation and uh, this uh, idea of prasanga versus swatantra prayoga of consequence or mere consequence uh, versus independent application of a logical ground this, and um... When Bhava Viveka explained uh, his thesis, so he said that it should be explained in three steps of uh, uh, thesis. Uh, I guess then he two was there and then one example. Yes. So could yes. you please give an example for that? Uh, I could, but I would have to look it up in the text because I don't want to uh, come up with the wrong example. He gives an example of the Adhyat Mikani Ayatanani. So it makes a prayoga for the internal entrances, but I do not remember the exact wording of uh, that whole prayoga. So that, I remember, yes? Is that uh, Chakshur Vigyana as a Paksha and then is of the Chakshur Vigyana, the example which he has given? I'm just looking uh, at the text now. Uh, which text are you looking at? Oh, sorry. It's a Bodhidarshan Pastana. <laughs> okay. 
But the, in the Prasanna Pada, I have some uh, memory that is about Adyatmikani Ayatanani. And of course, the Adyatmikani Ayatanani has to do with Chakshur Vijnana as well. Uh, but uh, if you want to see that, well, I would have to check the text. I don't want to misrepresent that particular prayog. It's in the first chapter of the Prasanna Pada. Yeah, that's helpful then uh, and then i think we have time for a few more questions so we can take our next slide as well so brother song our next slide how abhidharma relates to madhyamaka uh, how the function of chitta and chitta ex chitta explained through the madhyamaka perspective oh abhidharma is the most refined way to analyze perception. Therefore, in that sense, it's like the cornerstone of uh, conventional truths. However, Abhidharma and, and Abhidharma has the great advantage of going, of being the type of conventional truth that goes in the direction of emptiness. So I think there are these two important roles in uh, Madhyamaka. So that different types of Abhidharma, according to which particular uh, Madhyamaka master we're thinking of, they offer a viable system of conventional truths, which at the same time go in the direction of disclosing the nature of reality, even though in themselves they are still conventional truths. And regarding Chitta and Chaitta, two T's, uh, that depends from which Madhyamaka author we are thinking of, because depending on which type of uh, Abhidharma we're going to um, subscribe to, we're going to present them somewhat differently. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And then also the next slide. <laughs> how one should approach should the study approach. of Madhyamaka philosophy in academic setting. Okay. Um, well, what do you mean by academic setting? Um, let's say in a Buddhist scholarship. Buddhist scholarship is not necessarily academic. Like in terms of Buddhist studies, like in the field of Buddhist studies. In the field of Buddhist studies within the context of a modern university, you mean? Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, there, there are many different approaches, possible approaches. My personal preference is whichever approach is very careful about the textual sources. In terms of academic study of Madhyamaka, I think that that is the first and foremost uh, duty in a way of the researcher so as to offer a well-grounded interpretation or presentation of the Madhyamaka. So everything else in my mind is secondary within an academic context if one of course one can then go be i don't want to say beyond one can add something or bring madhyamaka to bear upon a slightly different context like for example some people use uh, madhyamaka tools and resources in order to enrich uh, certain concerns of uh, some styles of Western philosophical analysis. But in my opinion, that is a second step. There should be, first of all, this step of becoming as much as possible acquainted with the texts, spending time with it, understanding the overall context of Madhyamaka, getting the feel for the system, uh, and work on translations. This is uh, another point because uh, although Buddhist studies now has existed for a very long time, 
translations of philosophical classics, including Madhyamaka classics, are not so many, and they really vary in quality. So I think that uh, some emphasis on the study of texts, even the addition of texts, as well as the translation of texts, would be most beneficial. If one asks ask me what you think is... Other people have completely different approaches. Uh, maybe they have something to offer as well, but uh, it doesn't speak to me very much. Like anthropological approach, uh, sociology, etc. It just doesn't speak to me intellectually uh, much. It doesn't resonate with me. So I could not really offer uh, an active uh, defense or uh, uh, praise of that approach because I have myself some difficulty engaging with them but this is not to exclude them it's just to say that i'm not the best spokesperson for that but one might want to check them and uh, it could also be something useful in some contexts uh, and uh, the field of buddhist studies in general is very vague while it started a little bit with uh, textual studies, and that has remained to some extent its lifeline, but um, it has expanded into a very interdisciplinary maze. And so once we start looking at what is offered in terms of something vaguely connected to Madhyamaka throughout the world, we find all sorts of stuff. And uh, anyone is free to take up whatever they like uh, but each of us has uh, limited abilities and uh, to engage with different things and i personally um, do not find it very appealing to to engage with uh, certain more social science oriented approaches to the study of mandiana I don't know, long answer, but I hope that uh, it gave some idea. Yeah, so I guess like this is not at all the way we have studied, like for our MA at least, it was uh, just like collect some information in class, go to library, look for some book. Then uh, like the way we have to, we were, uh, we approached our studies with something like we didn't spend so much time with contemplation just finishing assignments, then exams come, right? have to write so many exams. And Maybe. somehow- So in, in your MA, so I have a question for you. So in your role in May, nobody ever suggested you to do some contemplation, never happened. Uh, it was you, of course. And then <laughs> very few people, like uh, I don't know, not really so many people, very few people and also uh, very, on very few occasions. Well, they might, it could be because they take it for granted because uh, they think that automatically you'll do it. That, that is one reason. The reason why I, uh, I mention it explicitly in, during my classes. Now, this might be very confusing for other people who are watching because <laughs> they might not know the background that actually uh, I'm a lecturer in the college where you study, so <laughs> this could be confusing for them. So I mentioned this for others. Uh, but the reason why I mentioned that you should reflect on things, spend a lot of time with the text, etc., is because over the years I have uh, observed that uh, while for me that was uh, somewhat uh, fortunately or unfortunately a very natural thing to do, and I thought that why otherwise would I ever study this stuff? Uh, but I noticed that uh, many students don't have that idea. They go through the motion somewhat uh, mechanically and uh, they gather a lot of uh, uh, information and they feel that their main duty is to be able to somewhat remember some of that information and repeat it at some point but information is not knowledge. That is a very simple point which goes beyond the study of Madhyamaka, 
Uh, information is something that can also exist in a computer. It can exist in a piece of paper. Uh, it's not really what makes it worth to engage with something as a human being. And uh, th there are further steps to move from information to knowledge. And many of these steps have to do with something that one has to do with one's own uh, mind yeah and i think that was a very good conclusion i think uh, if we engage with our studies in this way so we might get a feel for what we are studying otherwise really it becomes very mechanical and often it it is just for answering questions in exams yes which very often uh, is not memorable <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it is something that uh, we don't want to even remember because exams normally are not a good memory in our life. It's just... Uh, <laughs> so uh, it's good not to think in terms of the exam. Doing well in the exams should be a kind of a side effect. And uh, basically, my personal opinion, when we study something, we should not study to become scholars. That is a very important point. It's not a good intention. We should study for the knowledge. And uh, again, it goes back to the earlier point about uh, intention. If we are clear about our intention, then everything is easy, including the study of Madhyamaka, although it can be a bit challenging, but uh, the intention should uh, steer us towards the profitable and beneficial direction. Yeah, I said that because I saw signs that we have to say something nice for a conclusion, so. <laughs> okay. Yes. Okay, yeah. so. So now this is the end of our discussion, I think, yeah. But still, you know, Brother Sharab is asking if you have any last word. To any last word. Yeah. Any last word about, about? Madhya Maka? Brother Sharab. <laughs> okay. La last, last words sounds a bit ominous. Um, let me see. Yes. Uh, be patient. That would be my foremost advice. Don't expect quick result. You want to study Madhyamaka? Uh, it's... Uh, long process like any other buddhist philosophy you have to give it time to kind of uh not ferment but like you have to digest it and it takes many years so one has to relax from the beginning knowing that one is just accumulating the causes and conditions for eventually understanding not kind of uh, trying to catch something, uh, thinking why I'm not catching it, why I'm not catching it, but just relax and keep on accumulating the causes and conditions for understanding. That would be my suggestion. Otherwise, it's an endless frustration. Yeah, uh, so okay. We'll keep in mind. Okay, hmm? so let's end this session here we are already i think we have finished one and a half hour so i think okay. we have some, some announcement, announcement from for next next program on sattva better song um, can we have those slides for of upcoming event okay Yes, so uh, there's a guided meditation by Venerable Tenzing Dasil, which is entitled Finding Security in Uncertainty. So, which will be on 17th October. Okay, so please do join us on this event as well. Hope you will enjoy, hope you have enjoyed this session, this present session, and you will enjoy the upcoming sessions. So, once again, thank you very much for joining us. Yeah. Thank and, you. Uh, <laughs> Okay, so let's conclude this session by a short dedication prayer. Okay. <clears throat> the four great vows. 
sentient, sentient, sentient beings are numberless. We vow to save them all. Delusions are endless. We vow to cut from them all. The teachings are infinite. We vow to learn them all. The Buddha way is inconceivable. We vow to attain it. May all beings be well, happy and safe. Thank you. Yadavaptam maya punyam stuttvatvam stutibhajanam nimitta bandana petam bhuyatte na khilam jagat. Thank you everyone. Thank you for joining us. Thank you.